Hi, I'm Ryan Szymanski, curator for Battleship New Jersey Museum and Memorial. And today, we're finally doing a video that every single one of you guys has requested, and that is, what would my perfect battleship look like? People ask me what, all the time, what's my favorite battleship? And uh, my favorite battleship was never built. There, there was no perfect battleship built. There, there was no battleship with like a really, really cool, like fought in a thousand battles and, and did all these cool things single-handedly. Um, not like the ones I designed as a kid and built little wooden models of and, and moved around my bedroom floor. Uh, so I don't really have a favorite battleship, but if asked to design my perfect battleship, uh, well, first, we've got to narrow that down a lot. So today's video, uh, we're going to be looking at something contemporary to New Jersey. So something built in World War II in the United States around 45,000 tons. Just so that this doesn't go all out of proportion, this video ends up being 10 hours long. Uh, what would I have made battleship number 61 look like if I was in charge. I think one of your takeaways in this video will be um, it just isn't possible to build the perfect battleship because I'm going to list a number of uh, criteria that I want included and there's just no way to do it. Uh, not, not at this weight. The Washington Naval Treaties were great because it forced designers to build uh, to very specific limitations. And they, they came up with some really ingenious ways around that, which made their ships imperfect. But it, it means that my perfect battleship probably can't be built. So first of all, 45,000 tons, something about the size of an Iowa-class battleship. Uh, Panamax is vitally important. So the 108 foot width, very important. Now, the length, the Iowas are kind of long. It, it gives them a really high length to beam ratio, which is great for high speed, but it's not great for stability. So I would not at all be opposed to shortening an Iowa-class battleship. What does that do? It means that your hull is not as hydrodynamically efficient, so it will not be as fast. I'm willing to lose some speed on my ideal battleship. 33 knots is the fastest battleship ever built. It's not necessary. Other American battleships are 27 knots. I think somewhere around 30 knots is perfect. If you can build it up to 32 knots, you're equal to anything else in the world. Great. I don't think I'm going to be able to do that. Um, if it has to go down to 27 or 28 knots, it's still competitive and able to keep up with the carriers and, and the rest of the American battle line. Um, I would take that sacrifice if I have to, but 30 knots is probably my ideal speed for a World War II battle. What is my ideal propulsion plant getting her up to that speed? I'm a huge fan of turboelectric drive. Uh, many of the American battleships at the end of World War I and during the interwar period and the Lexington-class battle cruisers turned aircraft carriers used turboelectric drive. It is heavier than the steam turbines that the Iowas actually use. So that makes it an issue uh, with the treaty limitations. However, if this is just pie in the sky, what, what would I, if I'm the design bureau and I say I want a ship that has these criteria, turboelectric drive is what I'm going to ask for. Turboelectric drive allows you to better subdivide the ship. We recently did a video on the Midway class aircraft carriers and how their engineering plant is similar and different to the Iowa class. Check that out in the description down below. One of the things I love about the Midways is their subdivision. And I would take a Midway class's subdivision over an Iowa class's armored belt any day of the week. Uh, so the turboelectric drive allows you to have boilers and turbo generators in different smaller rooms as opposed to large engineering main spaces. And uh, this picture that we have that's kind of similar to what my ideal battleship would look like shows four engineering main spaces, same as the South Dakotas and North Carolinas. Hate it. Hate it. My ideal battleship has a couple of uh, like turbo generators in the middle, boiler rooms around the outside, then the torpedo defense around there. The ideal depth of torpedo defense during World War II 
is uh, probably somewhere around 24, 26 feet. The, the deeper you can make it, the more effective it's going to be, no matter what scheme you use. Even if you're using something as uh, that didn't quite work, like Pugli cylinders, or uh, if you're using something super efficient, like the American five-layer system, which is the torpedo defense I would want on my battleship in this situation. Uh, the, the depth is what matters. So something 24, 26 foot length is, uh, or depth is ideal. There's no way to do that on a ship that's 108 feet wide to fit through the Panama Canal and also has any sort of uh, good engineering uh, plant in it. So by having the boiler rooms, the fire rooms, be part of the torpedo defense system, it buys you a little bit more depth. Now my ideal battleship has both. A five layer defense system with a void, a fuel tank, a fuel tank, a void, and then a fire room, and then your engine room or generator room as the case may be. But I don't think that's possible in a 108 foot diameter. So uh, four shafts also is my ideal. Three shafts, it's really difficult to steer if your rudders are knocked out. So four shafts gives you a little bit more maneuverability there. I, I prefer a four shaft layout. I prefer a two rudder layout. So there are your uh, basic hull characteristics and engineering plant. So I'm reducing the speed of the ship. What am I gaining in place of that? What, what is the crux of my ideal battleship? Firepower. My ideal battleship would have four turrets in a balanced layout. That's the American standard layout. Uh, two turrets forward, two turrets aft. That, that is my ideal preferred layout. It's completely balanced and you can bring a lot of firepower to bear on either side. What is my ideal number of barrels per turret? Three. I think two is too few and eight barrels is the absolute minimum that you should be considering for a battleship less than eight barrels, and you're just not likely to land hits with your guns. Uh, so having four triple turrets, 12 total, that is my ideal. It's giving you a lot, a lot of firepower. And that's what battleships are designed to be. They, they are gun platforms. If you can get it somewhere else in the world quickly, great speeds speeds important if you can armor it really well great but designing a battleship firepower should be your top priority and uh, a balanced layout where if you get a turret knocked out it's okay i've still got nine barrels um during world war one you do see a lot of turrets knocked out less so in world war ii but uh, i like the american standard layout that's balanced that also allows you to both run from a target and still put a lot of fire on. If you're the faster ship and you want to keep the range opened up, you can do that. Or chase a target and, and still have a lot of barrels to put on it. So that is my ideal. During World War II in this time period, I would not build a ship with less than 16-inch guns. Uh, and the U.S. Navy doesn't really develop a light enough 18-inch gun to justify going that much larger. So 16 inch gun, ideal 12 16 inch guns is what I would go for in, in this design that's uh, around the same time period as New Jersey being constructed. Why 16 inch guns? Well, because other people are building battleships with 14, 15, 16, 18 inch guns. I'm spending a tremendous amount of money on a 45,000 ton ship. I should not be spending all that taxpayer money, all that national treasure on a ship that's going to be second rate. Um, a ship with 12 16-inch guns is going to be equal to any ship with a reasonable number of 18-inch guns. Uh, it's going to be equal to or superior to ships with 14 and 15-inch guns. Why would you build a brand new ship with smaller guns than everybody else is using? It's a waste of money. Uh, if there are treaties that are now stepping down the size of battleships, cool, great. But uh, 12 16-inch guns is what I would build in the 1940-1943 
time frame uh, where, where I'm laying my fictional Iowa class replacement down. I would be willing to accept a 16-inch 45 as opposed to a 16-inch 50. The 16-inch 50 is arguably the best battleship gun ever made. But, you know, the 16-inch 45 isn't that far off. You're not losing all that much going there. If we're mixing and matching things, that's a whole other story. We might be talking about, you know, I'd take a one-inch uh, gun caliber reduction and we'd talk about 15-inch guns. But in terms of the United States at this time, that gun doesn't exist, that shell doesn't exist. So, 16. And 16-inch 45 is, is fine with me. What's my secondary battery look like? Well, if you're designing the perfect battleship in World War II, it had better have 5-inch 38 caliber guns. Uh, I'll say that is arguably the best secondary weapon of World War II. Um, I would argue that it is the best. Some people might argue there's a different one, but that's a tough argument to make. The 5-inch uh, 38 is the best gun out there. there there are other fictional guns or guns in development that you could put in there, but I think for the weight, the 5 inch 38 is just perfect. My layout of those 5 inch 38s, I would do 10 twin mounts, but I would do one on each end, front and back, and then four on each broadside. So that gives you six to each side, or as many as five uh, forward and aft. Um, so that, that's one place where my ideal differs from this picture that we have. The, the picture that we have here is one of the preliminary designs to the Montanas. It's BB-65 number three uh, from February 1940. So that's one of the competing designs for a 45,000 ton successor to South Dakota. And it's probably the closest existing drawing to what my ideal battleship would look like. It's not perfect, but it gets you close enough. It gives you an idea. The big problem with that is now we've got four turrets on the center line. We've got two more five inch guns on the center line. We've got smoke stacks. I'm fine with one stack. Four stacks is most beautiful. Not on an Iowa class hole. Uh, two stacks is pretty good. I'm fine with, with trunking into one stack. That gives you better arcs of fire for your AA guns. Uh, so one stack's fine, but you still are eating up a ton of center line space. So you might not even be able to fit these five inch guns in the ideal arrangement. Worth pointing out, even if we're able to design fictional gun mounts or whatnot, um, I would always go with a dual-purpose gun. It's not going to be as good at either job, anti-surface or anti-air, but mixing your battery and having an anti-ship secondary gun and an anti-air secondary gun is not worth it. Go with a dual-purpose gun, always, um, if your nation makes one. So, that's... What I would do there, again, American ship during World War II, the 40 millimeters and the 20 millimeters are great, wouldn't change that. Um, since I know the trend of things, I would absolutely go with uh, twin mount 20 millimeters, or, 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 uh, if it's late enough, if, if this thing's being completed around 1945, I would do quad mount, thunderbolt mountings for the 20 millimeters. That, th those are, my favorite 20 millimeter mountings of all time. Uh, quad mount is putting more firepower out there, so you're more likely to stop those light war threats, those more powerful aircraft, and those kamikazes that you have to completely chew up, uh, or else they'll still hit your ship. So, if we're talking about a ship that's being built at the same time as New Jersey and Iowa, um, then yeah, it would have pretty much the same anti aircraft battery. I don't think you can do better than that. The Iowa class battleships were able to put the most weight of any aircraft shells in the air of any ship in World War II. Uh, if my ship is coming online a little bit later, if I get a little bit more leeway, I love the automatic three inch guns like Salem has and those Thunderbolt mountings. That's the only way to improve the any aircraft uh, battery of these ships. And at that point it is becoming ridiculous god tier AA. Uh, not even the aircraft carriers in World of Warships where you just can't shoot down their aircraft would be able to hit my battleship with those sorts of anti-aircraft guns. So we've talked about propulsion, we've talked about some of the basic stuff. Um, let's talk about armor plate. My favorite armor scheme 
is probably, um, especially for a broadside belt, we're looking at, say, uh, North Carolina is really close. It's got an angled belt, but it's only armored against 14-inch guns. Uh, ideally, the American uh, industrial complex is able to make 13.5-inch belt armor. They do that for the Tennessee and Colorado-class battleships. I think that's ideal. And if you are angling that, like North Carolina or the Iowas and South Dakotas have, even better. An exterior belt is better than an interior belt. I, I would definitely take an exterior belt if possible. But again, all these things I'm throwing on there, there, there's no way that you can do all this at a reasonable weight. And we'll talk about why a reasonable weight is important later on. So 13.5 inch angled exterior belt. Uh, that's starting to eat into your interior volume because your belt's coming in like this. I like North Carolina's hull forms with the torpedo bulges coming out. That's adding more buoyancy. Um, or HMS Hood has a very similar hull form. So something like that would be perfect. Uh, the six inch armored deck that the Iowas have is pretty reasonable. 8-inch would be better. Montana start to go in that direction, but that's not possible with any sort of reasonable belt on, on this sort of displacement. Um, so 6-inch deck, about 13.5-inch belt. I really like the layered system of the Iowas with an inch-and-a-half bomb deck, a 6-inch main deck, and then a splinter deck under it. So something like that is pretty good. Uh, with the belt, I much prefer a solid exterior belt to what the Iowas and South Dakotas have. The turrets, turret armor on the American fast battleships is, is reasonably good. The turrets and barb bats, I'd, I'd be willing to leave that where it is. There are probably even some spaces where you could shave weight off to save a couple hundred tons here or there. But if I had my choice, I, I would leave the armor about the same, uh, which is to say about 17 inches barb bats, about 17 inches turret bases, um, about nine and a half or nine and a quarter roof and uh, seven and a half sides, 12 inch back. That's not really for armor, that's just to counterweight the front of the turret. So that, that's pretty good. Uh, building the ship out of mostly STS plating, armor plate, it's more expensive, but makes for a stronger ship that, that's more rot resistant. So that's great. Um, we gotta start shaving weight somewhere. I would delete the conning tower. The conning tower is about 600 tons of weight, really high up in the ship. I need that top weight for radars and things like that. Uh, more anti-aircraft guns. And realistically, while it can stop a shell, I'm not sure it will stop a shell impact. And that might still destroy everybody and everything in the space. So I, I much prefer the British style, where you've got some splinter protection around your bridge, but an armor-piercing shell should pass in one side and out the other, doing as little damage as possible, as opposed to striking the armored conning tower and detonating. So we'll delete the conning tower, not important. A little bit of splinter protection around the bridge. Um, setting it up as a flagship makes sense. Why would you build a ship at 45,000 tons that wasn't gonna be a flagship? The ship will have a lot of space. I suspect because I've put a turret in here, I'm going to have far less internal volume, also because I'm more greatly subdividing the engineering spaces. So that's less good for a flagstaff, but still, just by virtue of being bigger than the South Dakotas and the North Carolinas, I'm going to have a lot more. Other intangible stuff, American fire control, American radar is pretty god tier during World War II, so I'm, uh, that's, the Iowa class already has the best stuff that's available, more or less. So I'm willing to just stick with that, much like keeping more or less the same anti-aircraft battery is good to go, unless I can have Thunderbolt mountings. Man, give me Thunderbolt mountings. Other intangibles, float planes. Float planes do still have a use on battleships. I would absolutely retain um, catapults and aircraft on the fantail. Um, on the fantail, if they detonate, all that fuel detonates and whatnot, it's not anywhere important. So. I like it there, and it frees up your midships where other ships have their catapults uh, for more of those anti-aircraft guns. My superstructure is already going to be more compressed than on an Iowa. It is, it's probably going to look 
close to a South Dakota. Um, and that's more or less what's depicted in this picture here. So, uh, likewise, I'm not going to put any boats in the superstructure. This picture does depict boats and boat cranes there. No, get rid of that. More anti-aircraft guns there. Uh, less flammable stuff there. The boats can be parked in between the aircraft on the fantail. In wartime, the Iowa's deployed without uh, most of their boats. So, so um, if I was to plug all of this information into Spring Sharp, and unfortunately I haven't had the time to mess around with a, with a Spring Sharp drawing um, or a ship bucket drawing or any, any of those other ones to do my, do my own depiction, uh, whew, this would definitely be more than 45,000 tons. Which brings us to why it's important to compromise. Uh, you know, if I have to go with the Iowa class armored belt, instead of what I described with a 13 inch exterior belt, a 13 and a half inch exterior belt, um, I would do it because if I build, if I design my battleship to be more than 45,000 tons, it's not going to get built. Check out the video in the description below uh, where we talk about why the Montana class wasn't built. It was just too much resources. You have to build a ship that you can still build in numbers they can go out and project power in various places or operate as a battle line against enemy fleets. Uh, if you have one battleship and somebody else comes at you with two or three smaller battleships, well, those are probably going to win. It's distributed lethality. The, the one major battleship, Bismarck, being attacked by multiple other battleships, you, your one will probably lose even if it is bigger and more powerful than the others that are coming after it. And even if, if you win your first two-on-one engagement, well, shoot, a few days later, you run into another two-on-one engagement, and you don't run away from that one. So uh, it, it is important that these ships are small enough that you can actually afford to buy them, and you can build a couple of them. I, I could easily design a 90,000 ton super ship that would make Senator Pitchfork Ben Tillman uh, drool. But it's never going to get built. And if it does get built, okay, cool. I'm trying to fight this war with a single battleship. How am I supposed to do shore bombardment off North Africa and in the Pacific and uh, in the Indian Ocean and the Mediterranean and the Atlantic all at the same time? How am I supposed to fight a multi-front war? So it is important that your battleship be large enough that she's not massively outclassed by other nations' battleships that are already out there, or else it's a waste of money. But also that it's not so large that it can never be built. Uh, and that's why the designers of this ship, and why ultimately with my design, I put all these criteria out there. Well, I'm going to have to cut half of those. There's no way... I've got enough centerline deck space or enough depth for my torpedo defense or enough weight for my armor when I've also just added in a fourth 2,200-ton turret. Uh, there's no way to do it. So, so my ship is going to have to compromise on a lot of the features that I think this is the best, this is the best, this is the best. And that's why no battleship was ever built that had all of the very best features. It's important to decide, well, this is most important firepower for a battleship, and this is next most important, um, and this, this is not important at all. We can cut the conning tower because, hey, that's great protection for four people, but is it worth 600 tons of weight? Start laying out some characteristics for your ideal battleship. Let us know in the comment section down below. There is a link in the description below to our Build a Battleship activity where you can design your own. We, we assigned weights to all these different things and you can add them on there. So be sure to check that out if you're interested or check out things like Spring Sharp or other programs like that. I'm sure there's a couple of video games that allow you to design your own ship. Um, so let me know what your ideal battleship looks like and also let me know what future videos you would like to see me design my perfect battleship. What would that... Uh, Give me parameters for that. Just Don't just say, design your perfect battleship. Okay, is that in the 80s? Is it in the teens? Is it pre-dreadnought? Is it something? Is it, I created my own parameters for this one, and I couldn't even stay inside of them. 
because I really want a Thunderbolt now thing, man. Um, but give me some parameters and, and maybe we'll include them in a future video. What's my ideal dreadnought look like? What's my ideal uh, German battleship look like? Can I design a better Bismarck? Yeah, piece of cake, easy. Let me know what you want in the comment section down below. Battleship New Jersey receives operating support from the New Jersey Department of State, also from a number of other businesses and private individuals like yourselves. We really appreciate your support. And there's a link in the description below if you'd like to continue donating to support the museum. It gives us the free time to do thought exercises like this. You can also support us by liking, sharing, and subscribing so more people find about our channel and the museum. Thanks for watching.